Great. Welcome to our final week of Batonage Forum, Batonage Connect, our uh, virtual webinar series. So it's been uh, action packed last few weeks and now we're in week four. Uh, so thank you all for sticking with us. Uh, we've got some great content planned for today, tomorrow mm -hmm. and Friday. Uh, so today's session is Money Talks, Are You Listening? Before we get started, I have some housekeeping. So as these breakout sessions, um, they are intended to be more interactive and more communication um, between panelists and attendees. And unfortunately, you know, we're not in person, but we do hope that you participate through the chat and Q&A functions. So we have the chat section, which is more of an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. So just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. And then there's the Q&A section. And that is where we'd like you to submit uh, questions for our speakers to answer uh, during or towards the end of the webinar. And we'll do our best to address all your questions, but if there are any outstanding, then we will aim to get those answered in a follow-up email uh, to all of you, our attendees, along with a recording of the session. So if you find yourself with any streaming issues, uh, you may want to encourage other members of your office or household to log off the internet to save on bandwidth. Uh, you may also want to log out and try again with another internet browser. Uh, Firefox and Chrome uh, seem to work well. Also just want to say thank you to our session sponsor, uh, Gabrielle Glass. And I'll go ahead and introduce our panel. So the moderator today is Jeannie Whitehouse. She's a winery consultant at Broke Markle Davis & Co. in the Napa Valley, as well as a writer and speaker. She is co-founder of Solve Services, which provides remote bookkeeping services to companies in the wine industry. She has been named a top 100 influencer by Accounting Today, one of 25 thought leaders in accounting and one of the 25 most powerful women in accounting by CPA Practice Advisor. We also have Monique Soltani. Monique is an award-winning journalist with a Bachelor of Arts in Broadcast Journalism and American Studies. She honed her reporting skills working at ABC, NBC, and CBS affiliates across the country, and now hosts Wine O TV, a fun, fresh, and informative syndicated wine, travel, and lifestyle show. Jennifer Chin is the founder and principal of Strategic Wine Solutions, a leading branding and marketing advisor to wineries, distributors, and vendors in the premium alcohol sector. By applying a holistic ap approach to brand building, her clients have seen significant growth in sales and have been featured in top publications within the wine industry and beyond. And Maia Parrish is the owner and wine events company of the wine events company, The Wine Suite, and creator of Tales of a Wine Mistress live show and blog. Maia is a wine judge for the Denver International Wine Competition and the Drink Pink Vino International Festival. Maia also owns and operates Parish Media LLC, which provides social media, startup creation, and education, passive income opportunities, and event management. So that's our great panel and looking forward to the conversation. So I'll turn it over to you, Jeannie. Thank you so much, Katie. It's a real honor to be here. Wow, what a bunch of women. Aren't they amazing? So excited. Um, you know, one of the gifts of being an old woman, a woman of a certain age, is that you can look backwards on your life and see where patterns came from. You can identify the patterns very clearly at this point. And um, you can see the inflection points and where those challenges actually became opportunities for you to rethink things. And I think we're gonna all agree that this whole COVID experience is one of those points. I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to take a moment if we can find the space to be by ourselves. And many of us women are single moms are unfairly taking the burden of these struggles on our backs. But if we can find time maybe in the shower to listen to our own internal quiet little voices, we can turn that inflection point into a reflection point. And I think many of us might find when we listen to our own hearts that there is a passion that burns deep within us that might drive us to do something else. And maybe that is to advance our own careers or maybe it's time that we start our own thing. But in either case, we're gonna find that there's a need for us to understand finance and accounting eventually. So what we're going to do today is hear from these incredibly multifaceted, talented women and hear about their own entrepreneurial dream 
Michael Gerber calls that an entrepreneurial spasm in his book, The E-Myth. <laughs> and so <laughs> we might think of it that way, but they've taken that burning flame of passion and found a way to turn it into their own business. So let's start with you, Monique. Would you call that spark that you had a spasm or a dream? You're muted. Can't hear you. Okay. There I'm, you go. I, said, I didn't know I had to do any work. I thought magical <laughs> people behind the scenes were making it all happen. That's all right. But, Real life. I, I would say spasm, more like spastic, is a term that has been used to describe my wild energy. Um, yeah, passion, spastic, spasm, whatever. Um, the dream has always been there. Uh, and, uh, you know, my entrepreneurial dream really started with telling stories. So I never really thought of myself as a business person or an entrepreneur. I've always thought of myself as a storyteller. So my background being in television news, um, I got to meet people from all different walks of life. And I, one of the things I loved about that was hearing their stories and seeing them shine. Uh, and I'd love to tell you a little bit more about how I segue, segued into wine, if I can, Jeannie, I, uh, if you're okay with that. Okay, so how did I end up taking my love of sharing stories in local television and transforming that into a love of wine? Well, this is an interesting story, and it starts with me being in uh, New York City at a time uh, early 2000s. I worked in a high-end restaurant, a steakhouse, which was oozing with masculinity, it was oozing with power, it was oozing with money, and I was oozing with insecurity. Uh, I didn't know anything about money, I certainly didn't know anything about wine, but I was thrust into this world that I'd never seen before. So I was extremely intimidated, I felt out of place, and I just didn't feel like I belonged. But what had happened for me along that journey is I started learning about wine, and when I started learning about wine, I felt empowered, and I felt like when I could speak about wine, I had a seat at the table. So for me, I felt so empowered learning about just how to talk about wine, how to open up a bottle of wine, how to have a conversation with people I might feel really intimidated talking to. And I don't know if you guys remember the early 2000s, <laughs> maybe some of us in this panel were around and old enough to drink, but they weren't exactly handing a wine list to a woman. And when you showed up to the table to talk about wine, they didn't want to hear from the little lady. So I was a little lady lady with a lot to say and I had something to say about wine and people listened and that to me was an extremely powerful gift that I was able to talk to people from different walks of life that I don't know without having that wine as a connection I would have been able to do. Uh, so take my love of storytelling, my love of television, and this newfound passion for wine. And I felt inspired, engaged, and really excited to share this way with women, young women around the world. So in the beginning, it was all geared towards women. I thought I can educate, entertain, and enlighten everyday women to the wonderful world of wine. And that was where it started, like I said, really the early days. And why I decided to do a show about wine is at that time, nobody was doing it. It. Nobody was doing wine like a talk show where you would be interviewing the makers, you would see where they were from, you know, there were wine reviews and that sort of thing, but they weren't really talking about wine. So I took these little ideas, I studied about wine, I knew about television, flash forward a couple years, I started working at a talk show, we could do all kinds of segments. I said, I want to do a wine segment. And they said, can you get it sponsored? If you can get it sponsored, you can do the segment. I was like, I can get anything sponsored. That's not hard. Just ask people for money, you know? So I went around, started asking people for money, and it was a good idea, and we did it. So a few years later, um, I turned it into a half-hour show about wine, and that's always, that's always been the goal. So that's where we are now. So the money just flowed right to oh, you. Oh, yeah. Just landed in my lap. <laughs> Bucket of money. I was like that. What is that Donald Duck guy character laying in the money? Uh, yeah, I just was swimming in the money. Uh, no, have you heard of sweat equity? Uh, sweat equity is when you do a lot of work and you do a lot of work on your own and you do a lot of work for free. So the money didn't come exactly in the beginning, but I put a ton of sweat equity into building the brand, um, doing every aspect of it. And I think one of the takeaways for me was always like, 
oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that because that's too much work. Well, then you start outsourcing, asking people what they're going to charge to shoot a video, to do this, to do that. And you go, wait a second. I want to tell the stories. I want to do the show. I can do all these different things. So how can I create a project or a, an episode for as little money as possible so I can do the show? Well, the reason, the way I could do it would be by shooting, writing, editing, producing, uh, you name it, and then funding, you know, getting the funds or self-funding is how it started. So that's our one minute warning. Okay, well, let me give you, get someone else, a beautiful lady, speak. I can go on for 45 minutes if you want. So anybody want to chime in on that, Maya or Jennifer? We're going to, if not, we're going to turn it over to Maya next. Okay. Maya, tell us about, Maya has like, 20,000 things going at the same time, in addition to being a mom. We all do, yeah. but I mean, business things, all kinds of really cool. So let's hear your story and, and uh, probably can talk about some sweat equity as well. Well, I'll just kind of start off basically where I'm at. Um, so uh, obviously I have my own business. I've been in business for a while, even though I've worked for the man during the day of, you know, I'll say most of my 30s, I always had a side business. I started catering first, private catering, and then I got into the wine portion. I got into all of my businesses um, based off of by force and based off of just having to build my own table, seeing opportunities that I that I was able to capitalize on and um, and just working in hospitality and customer service and then the wine field in that area. My background in HR, you know, I have a, a degree in uh, uh, journalism, <laughs> communication studies, journalism. Um, and then I, I started my master's in HR management, organizational development. I did caveat to wine and somewhere in that, but all of those factors have helped me. Um, I would just say that I'm now at a point that I want to open a school. I have come to that conclusion in the last year or so because out of force. Um, my situation and the things that I need to be more successful, to have the spaces that I want, um, I'm going to have to create those. I see holes in our community. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Say hello here. Thanks. I see holes in our community and within our community, within Colorado, within the wine community, within the women in wine community within big black woman, within being a mom, with having disabilities, with having issues that I can solve, right? And I kept having roadblocks. Like if you wanna have an event, you gotta to talk to people about having an event and they didn't want you to have an event. You know, I have to deal with lots of my, uh, of, of stereotypes. Colorado is a 4%, excuse me, Denver's 4% black. I'm in white spaces all the time, right? We have a, a high brown population here. Latino, they Chicanos, okay? They will cut you if you call them the wrong word, okay? So we have a high population out here, but representation in certain communities are, is not happening. And if you are new and you come in, especially if you have purple hair, right? Um, you have, you're in a community and they're like, well, what is she doing here? So you have to continue to prove yourself over and over. My school will fill those holes. Right. I will have a place for winemakers to come who want to come to Colorado because we have crazy laws here. Right. Um, I have I will have a space where they can have a, a taste. I'll have an actual educated tasting room where I can have classes that will be accredited. The WSET will be doing some of the Society of Wine Educators. We'll have a space where you can have a WeWork space because sometimes when I'm out and I needed a place to go Wi-Fi or get away from my kids and everything else that I needed to go to, whether you're wine or not, whether you're woman, whoever, you have a WeWork space, a small one. We'll also have a play, a small kitchen so I can have the chefs. So when the winemakers come, they can have a dinner. Okay, one night they'll have a trade night because I know social media, so I'm gonna invite all the trade one night. Then it'll be a space where I will rent, I will rent out, so I can make extra income again, multiple streams of income. Because if you don't know nothing about me, I like to eat, I like to drink, and I like to have some money. It help my community all at the same time. I don't feel no ways about it. Don't ask me why are you selling stuff in the time of COVID. I don't care because I'm making money, right? I'm looking at the pay gap that we have. Black women, 62 cents on a dollar, right? 
I'm looking at the black wealth that we are not accumulating <laughs> in the next 20 years. I'm looking at all of those things that, that I need to overcome, not only generational, but for my community. I love Denver. Denver doesn't love me all that much, but I love Denver, okay? I make no mistakes. I make no um, apologies about where I want. When I speak to people about the future of my school, I know that I have things that I have to learn, you know, learn about. And uh, I make it very, I make it very a point, I make it a point to say, this is what I want. I want to be business woman of the year. Okay, I have no problem when I go into my meetings, the last five that I've been in, I tell people I want to make money. I want to be about the community. I want to be safe because COVID, right? And I want to learn the business, right? But I, I, I and I want to be businesswoman of the year, period. <laughs> oh, it'll come to existence, so. And that's kind of where I'm at, so. So, you know, the roadblocks, the hurdles, what does it take to keep going, Maya, when people tell you no? How do you get over that? You have to learn the law. Listen, if you, you don't know the rules, so you can get beyond the rules, if you don't know how to game the system, if you don't have a lawyer review the contract, if you don't know the legal term, I'm about to, I'm going to become a gun owner. I, that was not a, that was a process, right? I had to learn the law. Because if any, because me getting stopped by a gun from a police officer is a whole nother conversation with a lot of people. I need to know the law. I need to know my rights. I need to know the gun laws. I need to know all of those things. So you need to be first educated, right? And then work the system. Ask people. Ask white men. Ask them direct questions. Ask your gay, your guy friends, what is money things ask for numbers do not be afraid for information because we don't have time anymore y'all we're in survival mode we're going to be in and out of COVID for at least a year or two okay if you do not know how to make money and have multiple streams of income and know the law you are not going to make it okay period all right thank you and a lot of passion Sorry. A lot of passion you got to be clear that it's worth all the pain and suffering right it I is Monique and Jennifer have chimed in any anything to add comments all right i think um starting your business calling it a spasm or calling it a kernel of an idea both are accurate and i think it takes a lot of courage to start your own business especially during this time but what i would say to everyone listening and if i can just take a moment first off thanks for joining us today um i think we're all very busy and struggling to pivot and you giving us your time today means a great deal and as a panel we spent some time thinking about what kind of content we felt would be most valuable so please do participate in the chat and the Q&A because this is really about how can we help you and how can we share our experiences that hopefully will provide some insight or in certain cases, inadvertently perhaps lift you up because people have done that for us in the past and Batanage is all about community. So to my path was a little bit different, but I think what we all share is an incredible passion and love for wine and it all starts there. Um, the best things I think are fundamental and simple and I love wine, full stop. That's why I started my business. Um, more practically speaking, I started my business because I felt that small, artisanal, family-owned wineries were not being properly served in the marketplace. Now, I'm not criticizing importers or domain or um, distributors. I think everyone is trying to do their best. But if you're a small domain or a small winery, your interests are not necessarily being best represented because each of those tiers have different priorities that will more often than not conflict with yours. And because of my background in uh, management consulting, and interestingly enough, as a concert pianist, um, I felt that not only you know, did I have enough of a business understanding given my business training, but also the love of wine and the artistic sensibility having been a pianist, 
to fully represent and manage a small winery's voice, profitability, pricing, sales, marketing, and distribution in the United States. And I will tell you that so much of my success has been driven by the clients that I work with. Um, you're, you know, Jenny's gonna ask us a lot of good questions. And in terms of kernels of advice, I would say that starting your own business is about reinforcing your love for something, whatever that something is, mm -hmm. and realizing how much other people can impact that love, either increase or decrease, is really important. And for me, that's incredibly important. I didn't want anything or anyone diluting my love for wine. And a lot of that has to do with working with extraordinary people who happen to be extraordinarily talented at making wine. And that makes a difference. It allows you to be that much more successful. And when you're in a services model like I am, it's often the difference between success and great success and being moderately happy and loving what you do. Jennifer, that's great insight. And I think one of the things that's really fun about being in the wine industry is the people. The, you know, Absolutely. we think, and, and I moved to California from the South. So my impression of wine is that it was a thing that I couldn't reach. It was unreachable. And, and I think we've all shared some aspect of we had to build our own seat at the table. And I think mm -hmm. that the chat has, has chimed in on that. But what you find in the real wine folks is a connection to the earth there's no stuffiness there's none of this highfalutin aspect of it and there are real people trying to do something and and share what they have mm -hmm. and it's really interesting to see and the financial goals are not always at the top of their list there's something oh, no. way deeper than that yeah, so there's a lot of education that happens around the financial aspect exactly and the wine education we do with consumers is not that different than the support that you know some of us me specifically just because i happen to be talking provide to um winemakers winemakers are really good at what they do no one really expects them to be an amazing financial manager right. to be able to dissect a p l in about 30 seconds frankly i don't want my french winemakers doing that that's my job i want them out in the fields doing what they do best talking to vines and making beautiful wines that's what they do, because I, I, I can't do that, and I don't want to do that. I'm not good at that. So fantastic. Thank you. So that leads us right into our next question. We're going to talk now about, so we have this dream. We have this burning flame going on, something around wine, and now we got to turn it into a business. So Maia, we're going to let you talk to us about how do you take that beautiful dream that you have and make a financial plan to bring it to fruition? How do you go about setting your financial goals and get started? Um, and I, full disclosure, thank you guys, full disclosure. So I do have a background in HR. So we always had to do payroll bookkeeping. So money in that conversation, FICO scores, I've said this before about Naj, those are things that I'm comfortable with. And I get that there are people who are not like that. Um, I, um, business plans are very important. Uh, this, this um, crystallization of a school I had to in a weekend come up with my business plan because this was coming at me faster than I thought right <laughs> um and so um, I have my uh, as you can see I have an idea you definitely need to have a business plan I realized that I there's sides of money that I do not know about right I need to know about foundation work right I didn't know that there was different types of foundation um, you need to know about grants. If there's some type of grant work that needs to be involved, you know, um, there's a private foundation. There's different 5013Cs. I have to educate myself in finance, right? So that has to happen. If I'm going to be an advocate for whatever, I have to learn poise. <laughs> I have to learn how to talk to people who may not respect me. You know, we're in a climate. I'm going to be talking a lot about racial I, and, and uh, inequality and income. And so I have to learn those, those um, attributes. I have to now take a course on that equity or diversity training, how to be poised. When someone's coming at you, especially if it is in a racial aspect or in an income aspect, I have to instill those things. So you have to have that. And just learn how to, what you need. I think it's very important for you to have a budget, not only have a budget, 
but also a budget that pays yourself. You have to pay, pay yourself. We do not pay ourselves when we incorporate our prices. Well, how many hours? How much time? If you need in their formulas, you guys, nothing's new out here in business. The only new things in innovation will be in health and in science, right? Okay. Everything else, there's a blueprint. There's somewhere you can go find it. YouTube University is great. You type in the year. You can do a lot of research. You can invest in programs in yourself. When I wanted to, I have a workbook coming out. I took a course on that. Okay. I have mentors that I've invested in, right? You need to know these things. You need to know the law, know the rules, and then take that and incorporate that. And then in addition, I would have to say, I emulate and I look at other businesses. I have four mentors, three are millennials. And I say that, and I just say that, okay? Because three of them are. One is not. <laughs> She's like a big sister to me, but I have a lot of support, okay? I have a woman who just helps me stay calm. She is my clarity coach, and I kid you not, she holds my breasts. That's what she does, right? Um, I know I need those things, right? I know I have things that, to support me to be more successful, right? You have to get, you if you know yourself, if you get in tune with yourself, then you have to, you have to support yourself, and that happens in business, too. Your foundation has to be intact i go to people i don't say i don't want my school to be around for 10 years i say i want my school to be around for 50 years when my daughter gets 30 okay and she wants to figure out what she wants to do 50 years black people do not think of legacy and foundational wealth it's not as as we are trying to so i want to make sure that that my system is very in foundation yes you need to have a business plan and you need to be prepared I saw the sunflower. I can't hear you, Jen. All right. Thank you so much. Um, it's not easy. You know, the passion takes you so far, and the money doesn't usually just fall from the trees. No, it we doesn't. decide we want to do the business. You got to shake it. You got to shake you gotta this shake tree. It. You got to dig for it. You got to hone it. And right? I love the, yeah, and learning to speak that language, that financial language, because they're going to ask it. They're going to throw terms at you that you don't understand. And I posted a book that is my go-to for education on financial statement information, which is a core premise of accounting language. So, Jennifer, let's go to you. You spent a lot of time in this arena. So, tell us about the financial goals for your own business and what you see in working with others. Well, I think what you'll probably hear, and you've already heard a great deal of, is the first thing about a business plan and the first thing about financial goals or goals period is do the work, do the homework, read every single word. This is your business. This is your initiative. It has your name on it. No one's going to protect your reputation or build your reputation the way you will. Think of it as an investment in you. Maia brought up a really good point about um, how to structure. And there are a lot of really great books. Um, Jenny just posted one. There are amazing resources available. Um, Maia mentioned a few. And there are so many more that, you know, accountants, CPAs, financial planners, that you can reach out to um, to better understand what your financial reality is and what it could look like. What I'd like to talk about is more along the lines of how do you evolve your business plan and business model? And that seems to be particularly relevant at this time when we are all trying to pivot. When the business model that we started out with or the business model that we're most comfortable with may not be working as well or may not be appropriate full stop given the fact that we are in a pandemic. And, you know, it's interesting because Sarah Bray, who I think many of you know, and I have had a lot of conversations about how you evolve your business model. And it starts with, and because I work on a services versus pricing model, it's a fundamental understanding of know your value. And what I mean when I say that is 
understand the skill set that you have. Then be very critical of your skill set vis-a-vis the competition and what your clients can get through other people. Then layer on another analysis. How unique, how different, how deep is your skill set? What are the assets that you have that are specific to you? Understand the environment that you're working in. We're working in a pandemic environment, which is very different than the environment that we were working in last year. Pricing across the board is different. So if you start out with the right fundamentals, know, know your financial goals, know what your P&L is, know your COGS, costs of goods sold. By the time you're done with your business plan, your cost of goods sold should be a number seared in your memory that you know down to the penny because that is a fundamental basis by which you start to build profitability and growth. If you understand the fundamentals of how your business is run, revenues and cost, then you can really and confidently understand how to structure profit margin. And when you put profit margin within the context of understanding your environment, and understanding your value vis-a-vis the unique assets that you bring to the marketplace, suddenly what you've done is by doing all this homework is create a very compelling story for yourself. And in the process, you've given yourself confidence because you've done all the homework, you know what you need to know backwards and forwards. And when it comes to negotiation, you confidently negotiate because you know exactly what your profit margin, your desired profit margin is, and what your costs are. Knowledge is power. Give yourself as much power as you can because this is an investment in yourself. So personally speaking, you know, this is something that I do every eight months. And since COVID, I've been revisiting it a lot more than every eight months. It's, and the more you do it, the quicker it goes, the more you do it, the better able you are to quickly hone in on value. And value can be defined in a couple different ways, but the most important definition for me, because I'm in a services pricing model, is how my clients perceive value. It's not, frankly, it's not really about what I think. Although, you know, once we work together, it's about the advice that I give them. But it's about what do they think? How do they perceive value? Because that's what they're going to pay for. I think that's a great point. And I think the panelists, uh, the uh, chat is bringing in some good comments as well. And one of those is a really hard thing is if there is something that you are passionate about that is, in fact, not achieving your financial goals, having the ability to walk away is something very difficult. Exactly. And the confidence to be able to say no. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I get much joy in saying no. No, I don't. <laughs> I still work on that one. It, took, it took me a while, but yes. now that I'm sort of getting into it, I like it. Age helps too. Yeah. You don't have oh, time yeah. to tolerate. I mean, I don't love the wrinkles, but I do like the confidence <laughs> that comes with it. Yeah. So Monique, that takes us to you. Let's hear about your financial setting yeah, out um, a plan and how you make those dreams come real. Absolutely, because I'm I, I'm totally different, right? Um, but some through lines there are similar, and, and one is definitely, and I'm looking at the chat, know your worth, right? Um, for me, it was always do what you love and the money will follow. Do what you love, the money will follow. I'm loving it, I'm loving it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm loving it. Where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the money? You know, so yes, there's the sweat equity. Yes, there's the do what you love and the money will follow. And it will, I mean, never get into it for, I mean, at least what I do, I'm passionate about telling stories. Like you can't be telling stories and be doing it. I mean, you can be doing it for money, but you, you really should be doing it for the love of what you're doing. And I think we're all on the same page with that. No one got into this to get rich. We got into it because we love what we're doing because of the passion. But knowing your worth is so complicated. And this is where I think the perspectives come in. And this is where I think uh, for me being a woman also comes in. 
what is your worth and knowing your number. So what do I mean when I say know your number? What is that number that you'll do the job for if you're setting your own rate mm -hmm. where you're going to do the job and you're not going to be a little bit bitter and mad about it and resentful? Um, for me, uh, my number would be very low, right? In the beginning, because, oh, I don't know. I don't want to ask. I don't want to be mean. What if they don't like me? I don't, I just want to be friendly. I want everyone to like me. And if I ask for money, that makes me mean. If I ask for money, that makes me bad. If that makes, ask for money, I'm not, somehow it's confrontational, right? So in the beginning, I think my number was low because my self-worth was lower. I didn't know how to ask for money in this way that was worth my time, right? So what would I do? I'd take, I'd ask for a little bit of money or no money, <laughs> by a little bit, I mean zero, um, and, or a little bit, and then I'd do it, and then I'd be bitter. Or then I'd do it, and then i find out everybody else is making this money, and they think you're making that, and then I thought, wait a second, I gotta have a number. I must have a number that I can do the job, and I feel good about the job I did. I do not feel like I've been taken advantage of. I don't feel, because it's so much work. It's not a little bit of work. It's a lot of bit of work, right? And so what is that number? And is that number relative to what the market will bear? Do I think I'm worth $25 million? And I'm like, hey, $25 million an episode. Hey, lady, you got 2,000 Instagram followers. You're not worth 25 million bucks, okay? So knowing your worth and knowing what the market will bear and trying to find a middle there. So I can tell the stories that I love. I can make money that I feel good about and I can continue to do that. And then I can still have this time at home, right? With my family. I think a real turning point for me is when I had small children. Most of you know, my, I have twins and they're going to be five in August. Okay. So once I realized how much money I had to pay in childcare on top of doing it, then on top of the sweat equity, on top of my time, on top of that, then I was like, whoa, okay, this is a meaningful amount of money because I have to pay someone now. I can't lose money. So again, just going back to that knowing your worth and asking for money doesn't make you bad or mean. That has always been something that I struggled with. And I've watched men in business and um, in my personal, my own perspective of seeing it, they didn't think it made them mean, they thought it made them smart. You're smart, you ask for what you're worth because that's where you were brought up, that's where you were trained, you know. I didn't know that, I didn't, wasn't brought up that way. I thought money was a bad thing and asking for it made you bad and having it made you really bad. So, you know, and I think we'll get to this in this next question, but the idea of does money, asking for money make you mean? No, it does not, it makes you smart. And does having money make you bad? No, it gives you opportunities. It doesn't make you bad. What you do with your money and what you do with your time and the kind of person that you are and how you show up to the room, that defines you. But having money doesn't inherently make you bad and asking for it doesn't inherently make you mean. So many times we have to change our beliefs. Yeah. About asking for money, about accepting money, about either our challenges with money from the past, and we have to overcome those to move forward. So that takes us right into our next topic. Thank you, Monique. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about some of the specific roadblocks that you encountered and some of the specific things that our listeners can apply in their own lives to try to overcome them. So in this case, we're going to start with Jennifer. Jennifer, roadblocks and help. How much time do we have again? You have about <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> um, <I'm laughs> You know, I, I think no matter what you do, and especially when you're passionate about something, you tend to take roadblocks more personally. Uh, I personally tend to take roadblocks as a personal challenge. Oh, you say I can't do that. Okay. Mm hmm. I went from piano to management consulting to wine. And um, my first job in wine was pretty incredible. And I had maybe three months of experience, which was basically reading Wine Spectator. But I was able to get that job out of pure luck and timing and persistence. I called the president of that company every six weeks, same time. It wasn't four weeks, it wasn't five weeks, because you know that would have been stalking. But every six weeks until she gave me a little bit of her time. And it's polite persistence. And then when that doesn't work, you tunnel and you find another way. One of um, the bosses that I worked with in wine when I first started, 
wasn't pleased that I was part of the team because he didn't pick me. He had a whole crew of individuals whom he wanted on his team and rightly so. And his passive aggressive way of dealing with it was to not help me at all. So he was traveling, I was new to wine, I knew nothing. You know, you walk into an office and you figure out who your allies are. You talk to the assistants, you talk to anyone who's gonna listen, figure out where the need is, figure out where the money is coming from, Maya will, will love this, and then understand how you can structure your role, your jobs, so that whatever you do, you can create a direct link to revenue or to net income. And what I mean when I say that is you're either showing that you're leading to an increase in top line sales, or you've done something that that's decreased cost, which is increased net income for the company. No one is ever going to argue with measurable value when you provide it. So this particular individual um, turned out to be an ally. Once he realized that A, he could not get rid of me by ignoring me, and B, that I was absolutely serious about learning everything that I could about wine, gaining the most out of the opportunity, and that I would outweigh him. Other things of, you know, I really am not interested when people try to put their sensibilities or insecurities on me, particularly when I don't agree with them. And that's a nice way of saying when I walk into a room and someone says, oh, but you know about wine? I'm no longer insulted by that because, because that's someone else's problem, not mine. Um, and in fact, I love the challenge of being able to change people's minds. And this is not about arrogance. I was raised in a culture where, like Maya said, legacy is very important. I am very much here because of everyone who came before me, especially the women in my family and the women worldwide who came before me that allow me to do what I do today. And so every time that I can change someone's mind, I feel like that's an opportunity to give back. Now, is that a particularly positive spin on it? Absolutely. But that's the way that I choose to look at things. Um, and at the end of the day, when someone is telling you that you can't do something, create your own lane. And create your own lane by finding the value and building success so that at the end of the day, you can measure it, you can prove it, and you, you can add that to your existing skill set. So you will have won two ways. So many good points. This is so, you guys are wonderful. Okay, Monique, yeah. And um, you know, proving your own value with numbers. Yeah. It's one of those gifts you can have. Monique, talk to us about yeah, the challenges and the tools. For sure, yeah, the challenges I think we talked about, my biggest roadblock was, uh, you know, my ideas about money and knowing my worth and asking for it. Uh, I learned, um, the tool that I learned that I think is one of the most valuable tools that maybe some people grow up learning about or they learn about in college or their moms or dads teach them that I didn't know anything about was this idea of social capital. Uh, surround yourself with greatness. Surround yourself with people that are not yes. where you are, but where you want to be. Okay, where do you want to be? I, I, I look at someone and I want to be around them. And it's not always about money, right? Do they, are they have great energy? Do they have great vibes? Are they good people? Are they decent people? Are they, are they spending their time in the room bringing people down? Or are they bringing people up? Okay. Those are the kinds of people you spend your time with. Your time is valuable. Everybody knows it now. Okay. There is nothing more valuable than your time. The breath you take is yours and spend it with people that build you up that don't bring you down. That's what I'm talking about in terms of energy and people. But in terms of money, if you want to make money, you better be around people that have got some money. Okay, find people with money and ask them questions. And it's not out of a place of, 
you know, it could be from a place of ignorance, fine. But like, if people really love to talk about themselves, right? So if you, if you want to be interesting, be interested, be interested in people. So when I was starting my business, uh, Why No TV, I, the business is actually called Think Media. I was fortunate enough that my husband was also starting a business at that exact same time. And here I am going around like, I'm going to do everything by myself. Me, me, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do it all. And he's like, I got a network. I'm going to be talking to my network. I'm surrounding myself with my network. And I'm asking my network questions. And I'm asking my network for money. And he's asking people for money. You're asking people for money and not a little bit of money, a lot of money. I go, wait a second. He's asking people for all these money. What did, she, what did he learn? Well, he went to business school. He grew up in a family that taught him the value of money and understood money. And he would ask friends for money. He would ask colleagues for money. And these people would be giving him money. I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my God, I got my little business. I don't want to be asking anybody for money because I don't want to owe anybody anything, you know? And so, no, I didn't take investors. I did not. But I saw what he did with his business at the exact same time I, he did with that I did. And I asked questions and I was there for every step of the road. And right now I'm still there. I, I'm around, I'm asking questions. Social capital cannot be undervalued. It, and I didn't know it. I never even heard the term. Okay. I had to Google the, I go, what is this term you're speaking of? It's the people you surround yourself with will build you up. Right. And then uh, I never really thought I had a mentor. When people talk about mentors, who's your mentor? What's your mentor? Mentor. I didn't grow up knowing about mentors. I don't know anything about mentors, but I can tell you about the women in the wine community in my life that have without them, there would be no wine OTV. I came here 10 years ago covering local news. I wanted to do wine. I put myself in this place. I'm going to do the stories. And women in this community from my very first sponsor was out of the blue was Beth Costa from the Wine Road. She says, Monique, I've seen you've been doing these stories. I hear you're, you're doing your own business. I want to I wanna sponsor you. Or to Beck Hopkins or to Kristen Green or any of these women, Joe Diaz, I can look at every accolade I've gotten. I can look at every dollar I've gotten and I can attach that to a woman in the wine business. And I'm sure some men too, but that really these relationships, and I didn't get these relationships collecting business cards, being like, oh, I want to be your friend. Here's a business card. Here's a business card. I got all these business cards. No, it's human connections, being authentic, being yourself, being true, having true human connections and interactions, and, and just being your authentic self and building on it. I saw the flower, so I'll be quiet, but that, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> Fantastic. So many good points. We all made like two hours for each of you guys. So um, let's go to Maya and let you talk about the roadblocks, the financial challenges, and how you overcame them. Maya? Um, okay, so... Uh -huh. I would have to say that obviously my I've have I have roadblocks, right? And so um, I'm not going to get into all that. You know, I will say there's a quote that I like to give to people. Um, I have to keep this in my forefront when it comes to when it comes to money, right? Uh, black women and girls um, right now are in the intersection of sexism and racism, right? Um, while sexism and racism are different different forms of discrimination, they manifest differently. And so those um, intersections and that discrimination perpetuates our racial and gender wealth gaps. I, and I, I now, while I'm learning about money, and I'm learning about these numbers, and I'm learning about all the things, I have to keep that in mind. That being said, I ask for money. I go in asking for money i remind them in the middle of the conversation of money and i end it at with, with the money because without the money nothing to get done if i just want to drink by myself and just at the house i can't do, i have to fund my household right i have to have money right so i had to get beyond that my relationship with money had to change your relationship with money, whatever it is, I say past, present, and future. You need to deal with your relationship money past, right? Whatever issues you got to have, whatever issues you have, whatever relationship you have as a child, you're taking that into the present, right? And as, as the present, you need to know how to price yourself. I'm going to just give you a quick six-step guide on how to price yourself. You need to look up the price for your state, your county. Is Everything's different by state and county, right? Know those numbers. Cal calculate your costs, right? Look at your market. Again, by state, by county, right? You want to know who your customers are. Google Analytics and Facebook 
analytics will tell you who your customer is. Even if you don't like them, they will give you your information, right? Consider the time. Actually, right, how long does it take you to research? How long does it take you to call? Is it two hours? Find out, right? Come to a fair profit margin. If you don't know, ask a dude. I tell you, ask a dude. When I did not know how much I needed to price for um, this event, I called my boy and he told me, right? I then came up with a range, right? When I did not know, I'm now writing again, trying to find my voice. When I did not know what the price system was to write to be a freelance, I called my mentor. I listened to her <laughs> and then I adopted what she said and I said, how can I make this work for me? Again, I look at other women, I look at other people and instead of me getting jealous or hating, I literally write down what I can see that they're doing or even the hate right if I hate the colors oh her colors look nice just on Instagram let's just say that I'm not gonna hate now I'm like how can I adopt this into my brand right how can I adopt this into my platform right you need to price yourself if you don't know you have to go in with a number you need to go in knowing what they know I have an event coming up I need to know price the entire event so then I can know what to ask for from my people right I always incorporate my money, my labor, my time. If you are a trifle, trifling customer, you get an extra fee. Okay, my mental health, I put that in the price. I put that in, I put the, if it's an event, I put the taxes, I put the, the licenses, I put the volunteer time in the fee, and then I price the event according to that, I make 30% off the cuff and then i in and then i put bonuses so i can have extra income because at the end of the day it's all you right you got to pay yourself for your time you got to pay your people to take care of them now you got coven issues if you having those type of events we're doing a lot of virtual events now right so you just have to make you said misunderstood oh, i'm looking at the numbers sorry but you just have to know what you what you, what you're worth right and if you don't know you got to find there's ladders is a great resource on um onet online is a great resource those are, are resources research properties that you can find to show you how much to price yourself right look at how much things cost in your area what is the income for the area what is the salary? And use all of those things to incorporate the price. But you definitely got to ask and stay educated, have a business plan, get an LLC. I, I, I marvel at the amount of people who don't have LLCs. I just marvel at it because it helps you in taxes. Um, I see the one minute, but really quick, I will have to say, um, as far as all of this, this helps you guys in business, especially if, when it comes to doing your taxes. And if I don't know if you guys haven't seen the 2020 W4 is totally different. <laughs> it's completely different. And if COVID wasn't happening, that would be the top news story. All I'm just saying, you know, just know your worth and ask for it and don't blink. Fantastic. Um, great one to end on. Thank you, Maya. So Monique has a sticky note there. Um, because it says know your worth and ask for it. it. I wrote it on a sticky note. Yeah, put it, it on our foreheads. One of my top three takeaways, it's like yeah. know your worth and ask for it. And you said it's it. So it's so hard. It's so know. hard for us as women. And it, I'm just yeah. so thankful to Maya to bring it in the nerdy accounting. Y'all, you need an accountant. You need an attorney. You need the experts to help. You. And if they can't help you understand information, find another one. Jennifer, you look like you have something to say over there. Agree you with know, that? I, th I think it's all it really, really important variations on a critical theme, which is understand your worth. And understanding your worth starts out, again, doing your homework and the fundamentals. What is your cost of goods sold? Yeah. When you understand that, when, you, when it's a number that you are so confident in, you are able to slide your profit margin percentage up or down based on parameters like, do I like this client? Do I not like this client? I mean, having, and ladies, this does not need to be a huge understanding of finance. No one wants, well, I, okay. Accountants are very, very good at what they do. 
Jenny is very, very good at what she does. And I will pay her a lot of money so that she can continue to do that at which she's very good at. I'm, I'm very good at other things, but there are certain fundamentals which we've echoed again and again in this conversation that you need to know not only for your financial stability and safety, but for the confidence and the maturity and the power that it gives back to yourself. Mm -hmm. Monique made a really good point about um, social capital and Maya made a really good point about clients. And what I've found is very selfishly, one of the reasons why I started my business is because I wanted to work with good people. Having been in management consulting, I'd had enough of being assigned to um, you know, companies and clients. I wanted to choose who I worked with. And ever since my first client, knock on wood, every single client has come to me through referral. Um, and again, that has so much to do with the fact that I work with, I work with extraordinary people. And those extraordinary people, birds of a feather, flock together. Um, and the higher quality of people that you work with, the more you will find yourself inspired to be better, to do better. And from a practical perspective, if I were to be very direct, one of my clients who's been my client for the last 10 years or so is Becky Wasserman and Company. When, when someone calls up Becky and asks about me and she says, oh, Jennifer is really serious. That means a lot to me personally, and that is money professionally. Your social capital, your social network, your business network, understand that value and understand your value within that. So now it's time for us to open it up to questions. You want to take Absolutely. some questions from the audience, if you can yeah. turn them into the question and answer pane. We have some in there. I think one question is, um, there's a question that came up about us asking for less money as consultants or as, as um, employees or whatever it is than men do. Anybody want to chime in on that one? Don't do that. That's good. There's nothing else to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ask for what you need and what you're worth. Monique? And well, right. just chiming in, I think that sets the bar, right? Like when you take what you're less than your worth yeah. than, then that's how people see you. And it took yeah. me a while. Like I took a job once and it was less than what I was worth. And then those people saw me that way. And then I became that way. And then all of a sudden I was less than I was worth. And I was like, whoa, I'm better than this. And it wasn't, it's so subtle. It happens and it's so subtle that you don't even know really that it's happening. And just given that the, the place that we're in in time, I really wanna, and if we can quickly talk about the power of the pivot. I wrote this on a, you know, and I know um, Jennifer talked about it a little bit, but we are in a time of pivoting right now. Like the world is pivoting, your life will pivot. Things will happen that you cannot even imagine. Okay, and your ability to pivot with your business, your personal life, with the world, to, to, to be able to pivot pivot is what successful, powerful people do. That social capital, I started asking them questions a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago. They're talking about pivoting. They're talking about smart people pivot, powerful people pivot. So how are we all pivoting now? I feel like I've personally been pivoting for a couple years, but the world is pivoting now. And are you rolling with it, right? Are you rigid? Are you holding on to the way you thought it was going to turn out? Are you moving forward? Are you progressing? Uh, went off tangent there, but I, I know we're out of time and I really thought that was uh, important topic to bring up just given the current climate great and uh Jeannie we've got a question maybe to the panel before we wrap here uh does anyone else get the feeling that a lot of women become entrepreneurs because they feel obliged to build their own table whereas mm -hmm. men are more inspired by ideas or new processes I think that is both I think we are just as inspired we just, we, we, we're equally right. But then when we go and execute, there's a lot of, of challenges, right? So then you just kind of say, after a while, if it's the goal that you really want, right? Um, then you keep going. I know how to make money. As long as I have, if I find a phone, I can be on the beach. I know how to make money. 
Once you learn how to make money, once you learn the framework and algorithms, because it's nothing but numbers, once you learn that, you can, that confidence, you can take that with, right? And, 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 and that's investment in yourself, investment in education, learning, asking questions, right? So I take that confidence with me no matter what's going on in the climate. The government, I'm not saying it doesn't affect me. It does affect me, right? But no matter what, now that I have what I have, whatever's going to happen, right, it's going to happen. I know what I know. And that's why you have to be confident about what you learn, what you know, and what you bring it to the table, right? Um, I just want people to come to my events. Now, I just know how to get them there now. <laughs> I'll just say that. Uh, and I know how to, I'm trying to get the money, right? So those things... It's just something that, you know, you got to just, I just got to go for it, y'all. We don't have time to sit here no more. I think that's a really good question. Um, and I've, you know, I honestly don't know the answer to why a lot of, you know, and, and I can't speak for everyone. I started my company because, and I will admit this character flaw, I'm not a very patient person. Um, and if I'm going to work that hard, I'd like to work very hard for people that I enjoy working with, whom I want to help, whom I can help, and where that profitability will be very much enjoyed by myself and the people that I work with and the individuals that I can share that with. That's why I started my business. Um, inspiration comes from within. It also comes from your social network and your support network. Monique, you want to have a parting? The ability to, to sustain your own business in the longer term is going to go, and ladies, we've said this a million times, to understanding your value. Thank you. Monique? I'll just end on and trust your gut. You know, just go with your gut. Your gut's always going to lead you in the right direction. You know, you know what you're worth and you, you know um, what you're good at and, and do what yes, you're good at. Yes, ma'am. And listen to that voice. The one inside I will, not the other I will just find, I'll just add that once you know your worth, relationships are very important. And, and collaborations. Um, relationships are very important at the end in, in your time. Once you get your ideas and you have your stuff, the, the relationships that you have in your network will definitely help you to, to be more um, um, successful. Because by that time, people know who you are, right? Anybody who works with me, they know what they're getting. Yeah. So, you know, and if you decide to work with me, then great, you know. So their relationships are very important. Try to keep those, maintain them, keep them healthy. And, uh, you know, that's I think, and on that note, we'll say thank you to Batinaj for giving you all and all of us a network that we can tap into and for bringing us all together to, to share this information. Thank, thank you guys, thank everyone, you so to participate you. for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank guys. You. Thank bye you. Thank you, Jeannie. Thanks to the panel. Um, that was really interactive. Great chat going on. So thank you. Thank you, ladies, for that. Um, we hope that you will join us tomorrow for advancing your career in the wine business. That will take place at 10 a.m. Pacific uh, tomorrow, July 9th. And also, don't forget, um, there's also the virtual walk around uh, tasting that's still going on on the Batonage website. So be sure to check out those women winemaker videos and also the virtual swag bag. You still got some discounts and things in there. So I hope you all take advantage. And then just a uh, shout out to our 2020 charity partners, Southern Smoke Foundation and Race Forward. So thank you all uh, to our panel again and to our attendees.